Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning and welcome dear friends to this module of the week. In the previous modules, we have looked at the media representations about which black feminism has talked as well as black women's attempts towards resistance to the dominant concepts of feminism, whether it is in the way of developing their own perceptions of collectivity in terms of music or it has been their understanding and development of womanism, a term which Ellis Walker had developed. So, all these movements and efforts gradually lead us towards what is known as intersectionality, a word which has been used for the first time by Crenshaw. Intersectionality is being widely taken up by his scholars in order to understand diverse intellectual and political projects as well as it is being applied at the grassroots level. This is considered to be a heuristic approach as it provides us an immediacy towards the solution of problems and to make judgments in a quick and efficient manner. It also helps us to understand the complexities of variegated structures of the world. As this particular diagram helps us to understand, intersectionality is a framework for conceptualizing either a person or a group of people or for that matter a social problem which is affected by several discriminations or disadvantages. It also considers the overlapping of these identities and experiences to understand the complexities of prejudices which such people have to face. We can say that the intersectional theory asserts that people are often disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression. For example, their differences in terms of race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion as well as other identity markers often result in independent systems of impairment. Taken together we can say that these intersections often result in variegated means of operation and therefore, this approach helps us to understand the peculiarities of difficulties and problems faced by these individuals or segments of society. So, we can say that as a qualitative analytic framework, intersectionality recognizes that the identity markers do not exist independently of each other. For example, the identity markers of being a woman or a black or a minority or having a particular sexual orientation etc. So, these identity markers inform each other and therefore, they result in a convergence of operation. For the first time, this term was coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in a 1989 paper, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics. Kimberly Crenshaw was a trained lawyer and as a practitioner of law, she realized that often the same law is able to marginalize black women as it is understood differently in the context of different races. Still as we have discussed earlier in the previous modules, the approach had emerged earlier. 
during the 1960s and 70s, various African American women activists as well as theorists realized that most of their needs fall through the cracks of anti-racist social movements, feminisms as well as unions which are being organized for workers right. And the reason was that all these social movements were upholding only a single category of analysis at the expense of others. For example, the anti-racist social movements were against the racial discrimination only, not per se the combination of a woman and race. Similarly, the feminist movement was only against a gender-based discrimination, but it overlooked the intersections of the race. So, you would find that the same strategy was being adopted by the union movements which were against the exploitation of the labor. So, various feminist theorists had started to feel that the existing social protest movements are unable to represent their requirements adequately. So, we can say that during the second wave of feminism, the participation of black women was rather less. So, they felt that the African American women are doubly marginalized and a single focus lens or social inequality leaves hardly any space for them to address the complexity of social problems they have to face. So, they were encouraged towards the development of a theoretical perspective that would be able to accommodate it, their experiences as they are going through. Even before this term was coined, there were theorists as we have discussed in the previous two modules and we would also discuss in the next two modules of this week. At the same time, there were certain collectives and I would refer to here the Combehi River Collective, a black feminist lesbian organization which had released this statement in 1978. It defined and encouraged black feminism and in the introduction it stated that and I quote, the synthesis of these operations creates the conditions of our lives. As black women we see black feminism as the logical political movement to combat the manifold and simultaneous operations that all women of color face, unquote. So, these women were fighting for representation, whether it was the civil rights movements or the feminist movement or the labor unions. So, when Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, she expanded on what was felt by the previous thinkers as well as the theoretical statements of various organizations like the collectives theory and the statement which we have referred to just now. And she recognized that the legal system, the existing laws fail to protect black women and that the black women experience injustices differently from the white women. And that in order to understand the typical nature of the operation and exploitation of black women, it is necessary to look at the intersecting statements of blackness as well as womanhood. So, this theory has become necessary now to understand a wide range of differences including individual sexual orientation, age, disability, class, etc. Now, we find that even in environmental studies, this approach is being taken up. So, many people have started to use intersectionality as a heuristic problem solving or analytical tool. When Crenshaw coined this term, she wanted to explain the overwhelming underrepresentation of violence against African American women in activism, politics, and media. In this interview, we have referred to certain pertinent sections of our interview. The complete interview is rather quite detailed and it is available at the link which is pasted below. So those of you who recognize the first group of names know that these were African Americans who've been killed by the police over the last two and a half years. 
What you may not know is that the other list is also African Americans who have been killed within the last two years. Only one thing distinguishes the names that you know from the names that you don't know: gender. So let me first let you know that there's nothing at all distinct about this audience that explains the pattern of recognition that we've just seen. I've done this exercise dozens of times around the country. I've done it to women's rights organizations. I've done it with civil rights groups. I've done it with professors. I've done it with students. I've done it with psychologists. I've done it with sociologists. I've done it even with progressive members of Congress. And everywhere, the awareness of the level of police violence that Black women experience is exceedingly low. Now, it is surprising, isn't it, that this would be the case? I mean, there are two issues involved here. There's police violence against African Americans, and there's violence against women. Two issues that have been talked about a lot lately. But when we think about who is implicated by these problems, when we think about who's victimized by these problems, the names of these black women never come to mind. Now, communications experts tell us that. When facts do not fit with the available frames, people have a difficult time incorporating new facts into their way of thinking about a problem. These women's names have slipped through our consciousness because there are no frames for us to see them, no frames for us to remember them, no frames for us to hold them. As a consequence, reporters don't lead with them. Policymakers don't think about them, and and politicians aren't encouraged or demanded that they speak to them. Now you might ask, well, why does a frame matter? I mean, after all, an issue that affects black people and an issue that affects women wouldn't that necessarily include black people who are women and women who are black people? Well, the simple answer is that this is a trickle-down approach to social justice, and many times, it just doesn't work. Without frames that allow us to see how social problems impact all the members of a targeted group, many will fall through the cracks of our movements, left to suffer in virtual isolation. But it doesn't have to be this way. Many years ago, I began to use the term intersectionality to deal with the fact that many of our social justice problems, like racism and sexism, are often overlapping, creating multiple levels of social injustice. So, when the third wave feminists started to produce their work, they found that they were struggling. To look at the best way to theorize the relationship between different dimensions of gender, race, class, and sexuality. Now, the main differences in feminist approaches tended to be understood broadly in terms of socialist, liberal, or radical feminists. And in all these three approaches, we find that the question of racism forms a point of Conflict. Also, the understanding of the social class remains a contested category in all these different approaches of feminist theory. So, intersectional approach shifted the focus to encompass several dimensions simultaneously under study. Here, I would like to quote Annie McClintock, who has used this intersectional analysis to suggest. That in order to understand colonialism and post-colonialism, we must first recognize that race, gender, and class are not distinct or isolated realms of experience. In a state, they come into existence in and through contradictory and conflictual relations to each other. She has perpetuated the argument which was propounded by Catherine Hall. And shows that the Victorians connected race, class, and gender in ways that promoted imperialism abroad 
and class distinctions in Britain. This reference to McClintock suggests the struggle which the feminist thinkers were going through in order to theorize the best approach towards these dimensions in a simultaneous manner. I would also refer to the work of Patricia Collins and Bilge who in their 2016 work titled Intersectionality have tried to pursue multiple goals. Firstly, they suggest that this concept can be used as a theory or a methodology and also as an activist practice. For example, this perspective is reassuring for analyzing contemporary cross-border projects related with different types of domination. It may be related with racism, sexism, capitalism, homophobia or xenophobia, etc. Secondly, they suggest that intersectional theorizing enables us to question the growing dogmatism in academia. And as Collins has argued, and I quote, uncritically defining or celebrating intersectionality or any other form of critical theorizing as a finished social theory undercuts its critical potential. Thirdly, echoing the sentiments of Antonio Gramsci when he refers to the organic intellectual, it advocates the inclusion of activists and practitioners in different knowledge projects. And they argue that counter hegemonic knowledge production is not limited to academia only, but it requires a dialogic relationship between activists and scholars. So, we find that in this approach which has been taken up by Collins and Bilge in this work, there is a particular continuity of applying this theory in practical ways too, instead of isolating theory and practice. So, when we look at intersectionality as a critical inquiry, we find that invokes a broad sense of using intersectional frameworks to study a range of social phenomena. For example, it can be the organizational structure of a sports activity or a philosophical approach that wants to shape or reshape global or national public policies or different type of social movements. So, across local, regional, national or global social context, we find that it becomes a framework to study them. It consists of using the experiences of disenfranchised groups to deepen our understanding of human life and behavior to understand the nature of a peculiar operation. Feminist scholars in post-colonial studies found critical theoretical insights in the framework of intersectionality and they felt that it has enabled them to assess the influence of continental post-structuralist philosophy on the field and use intersectional frameworks in ways that reflect colonial as well as post-colonial realities. At the same time, they felt that it enabled them to perceive privileges as well as imbalances of power and oppression among the experiences of the marginalized sections of different societies. So, intersectionality is not simply a method for doing research in an academic environment, but it also becomes a tool for empowering people. In different degrees, we find that scholars and practitioners in different areas related with social work or criminology or public health or law, education or environment recognize the knowledge production in their respective fields and think that this production of knowledge cannot be separated from professional practices. So, intersectionality is trying to interconnect theory and practice in a closer fashion. However, I would also like to quote here certain scholars who find that the concept of intersectionality is not compatible with the idea of Christianity as it offers a different view in terms of sin and individual salvation. The reference which is cited here would be able to provide a more detailed analysis of this point.
So, as we have seen intersectionality as a critical praxis as well as as a critical theory rejects the binary conception that sees that scholarship is to provide theoretical strands only and practice is more related with the translation of these theories into real life settings. So, we find that as critical praxis it requires using the knowledge which has been gained through practice to guide subsequent actions in our everyday situations. If we look at the core ideas of intersectionality, we also understand that it was during the academic debates and movements during the 1960s and 70s that most of the elaboration of them was done. During this time, we find that women of color engaged themselves with the ideas and practices of not only civil rights and black power, but also Chicano liberation, red power and Asian American movements from within racially and ethnically segregated neighborhoods. So, within these movements, we find that to begin with, women were typically subordinated to men despite having a titular equality and therefore, different problems started to emerge. During this time, the concept or rather the epithet of black feminism started to become popular. Mexican American feminists also articulated a political subjectivity as Chicana and formed an autonomous Chicana feminist movement. They realized the importance of testing ideas within political context and conversely they used what they had learnt in social movements to frame analysis of social inequality. For example, although separated from Afro-Brazilian women by geography, linguistic differences and different nationalistic histories, African American women understood their difficulties that in order to challenge the oppression they have to face cannot be solved only by race only, gender only or class only perspective for example. So, Kimberly Crenshaw's article mapping the margins intersectionality, identity, politics and violence against women of color argues that intersectional inquiry as well as praxis are both needed to address the social problem of violence against women of color. Being a practitioner of law, she was particularly conscious of the existence of violence in different way as far as women of color are concerned. So, Crenshaw's experiences as a lawyer and civil rights activist made her profoundly sensitive about the shape and effects of violence against women of color, which was very different from what was faced by white women. A close reading of this article helps us to understand intersectionality as a legitimate field of academic inquiry as well as as a form of praxis which has been honed within social movement settings. So, Crenshaw has focused on the experiences of women of color, a group which is devalued from the perspective of academia as well as within broader dominant US society. She argues that the experiences of women of color are essential in as well as of themselves, but become especially significant in understanding their social issues as well as remedying them. She also recognizes that the term women of color rests on an understanding of solidarity that has to be constructed and not assumed. So, this idea of Crenshaw that solidarity has to be constructed and not assumed has also been investigated into by several black feminist scholars before and after her. So, distinctive angles of visions and challenges accompany differential social locations. So, this is a theme which has been developed via her attention to different experiences of women as far as domestic violence is concerned. Crenshaw perceives that 
discourses in the context of violence against women come from a particular standpoint. However, this standpoint or the perspective of women of color about this issue is often obscured. She places herself within her narrative where she self identifies as a black feminist and thus she is able to signal a particularly epistemological stance for scholars who are engaged with such issues. This is also able to valorize experience and embodied knowledge as it is able to valorize the theme of responsibility and accountability accompanying such knowledge. So, her innovation lies in building her argument from the ground up from the experiences of women of color and then showing how multiple systems of power are inseparable in the ways they impact their lives. So, she argues that women of color's needs cannot be met by looking at any single category of analysis. In this article, Crenshaw identifies related issues and separates them into three categories of mutually constructing systems of power. So, they are structural intersectionality, political intersectionality and representational intersectionality. Structural intersectionality talks about the ways in which the location of women of color at the intersection of race and gender marks their actual experiences of different types of violence, domestic violence, rape and also the remedial action, the reformative action which can be taken in this context qualitatively different from that of white women. Political intersectionality is related with how the feminist as well as the anti-racist politics have often helped to marginalize the issue of violence for women of color. It sounds ironical to begin with, but Kimberly Crenshaw has been able to support this argument with a detailed analysis. Representational intersectionality is about the cultural construction of women of color, which can elide the particular location of women of color and can also be a source of intersectional disempowerment. Later on we would find that representational intersectionality impacts not only the women of color, but also the men of color. To further detail her understanding of structural intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw quotes examples of immigrant women who are vulnerable to spousal violence for fear of being deported. At the same time, their lack of understanding of the language of the land as well as cultural barriers and pressures of their own societies within a different land add to their difficulties. She suggests that women of color are differently situated in social, economic and political worlds. So, their subordination is coupled with the institutional expectations which are based on non-intersectional contexts and therefore are inappropriate for them. It also limits opportunities for meaningful intervention on their behalf. She gives a particular example of how women of color need more money for shelter and housing in comparison to white women. However, this is not adequately covered for them, yet we find that this particular necessity is not addressed properly. It also creates certain difficulties for their counsellors often resulting in burnout cases among them. As far as the political intersectionality is concerned, she is able to illustrate various incidents to illustrate the inadequacy of legal support for women of colour. She documents gender biases often compounding in the marginalization of rape in their cases. For example, if a black woman is raped, we find that the level of seriousness is different and similarly, if the perpetrator of crime happens to be a black man, we find that the social stigma is more. Similarly, in representational intersectionality, we find that the devaluation of women of color is implicit in different ways of cultural 
imagery. Crenshaw suggests the idea that women, not only women of color, but women in general face routine violence and these experiences shape their life. They have also learnt that the political demands of millions are normally addressed more powerfully than the pleas of few isolated voices. So, this politicization also transforms the ways in which society has started to understand violence against women. For example, there was a time when domestic violence, marital rape, battering etc. were seen as private family matters and they were considered as aberrational not as norms and still we find that over a passage of time they have come to be understood as a part of a broad scale system of domination that affects women as a class and not an isolated woman for example. This process of recognizing as social and systematic what was earlier perceived as isolated and individual has characterized the identity politics of people of color. And for people of color, identity based politics has always been a source of strength, community understanding and development and intellectual upgradations. So, intersectionality would be useful as a way of mediating the tensions between assertions of multiple identities. So, there are categories such as gender and race which have their significance in isolation, but for clustering of power and understanding subordination we have to ground our arguments on an intersectional approach. If we take these categories in isolation, we fail in developing any meaningful identity or solution. Not because these categories are socially constructed, but because the descriptive content of these categories and narratives on which they are based have privileged some experiences and excluded others. So, this tendency of including some arguments and excluding others creates a social imbalance. For example, narratives of race are based on black men and narratives of gender are based on white middle class women. So, the solution lies in asserting those crucial aspects of location and or multiple dimensions of identity that have been erased. Understanding intersectionality will better acknowledge differences and negotiate the means to express them in a constructive manner. Crenshaw in a work speaks to two primary audiences within academia. Firstly, she looks at people who work in the area of social justice and secondly, she looks at those people who try to look at the value of narrative traditions. Her work speaks to activists and scholars whose social movement sensibilities have embraced the social justice ethos of intersectionality. For example, race, class, gender scholars and those in the emerging fields of critical race studies. Secondly, the post-structuralist narrative dimension of her analysis was also well received by scholars who saw the value of narrative traditions and truth telling. So, Crenshaw aims to challenge academic norms. Similarly, we find that the idea of intersectionality has become important in different global projects, not only as an analytical tool, but also as a political tool. It is being increasingly deployed within a broad based heterogeneous constellation of global environmental justice projects, as well as in the growing body of research on climate change and other environmental issues. The conceptualization and preparations for the 2001 UN World Conference against Racism, which took place in Durban, South Africa, played an essential role in intersectionality's engagement with human rights issues. The title of the conference in itself was historic. The term related intolerance linked racism to its intersections 
with, for example, poverty, gender discrimination, immigration and homophobia, etc. In May 2000, the first UN Preparatory Committee in Geneva included representatives from different countries like Brazil, India, Portugal, UK, Israel, Guatemala, Mali, Philippines and Uganda. These countries brought multi-issue frameworks and they reflected on the complexities of their lived experiences and political struggles. Following this meeting, references to intersectionality in the international arena have become increasingly common. Intersectionality has facilitated a complex understanding of individual identities and has given us a world to understand its necessity. The extensive body of scholarship in this area engages themes of individual identities as intersecting as well as performative and this approach has changed the meaning of identity from something which one has to something one does. For example, instead of being a fixed essence that a person is able to carry from one situation to the other, individual identities are now seen as differentially performed from one social context to the other. And these social contexts in turn are shaped by intersecting power relations. Stuart Hall has been able to encapsulate this tension between the performative nature of identity as well as the significance of social structures. Identity is not a set of fixed attributes as he had alerted us earlier. The unchanging essence of the inner self, but a constantly shifting process of positioning. Crenshaw's contributions in the development of this approach as well as in naming this particular approach has made essential contributions to reconceptualizing individual identity and subjectivity. For many, it has become a space of individual empowerment. To conclude, we can say that intersectional prisms excavate and expose multi-layered structures of power and domination by adopting a praxis approach. It is also able to engage those conditions that shape and influence the interpretive lenses through which knowledge is produced and disseminated. One must take into account the links which exist between various axes that intersectionality highlights to fully grasp how power and knowledge is dispersed. We would continue our discussion of intersectionality in the works of bell hooks in the next module. Thank you.